right. Thank you all for coming this way. I think that's uh, really nice of you. I know I'm the, one of the last barriers between you and you know, having maybe time off. Um, so you know, I, I, I'll try to entertain you with failing very fast. Um, and, and hopefully, I can do that by showing you how we are trying to fail fast with data. Uh, my name is Mika. I work for Maersk, as you can see on this slide. I'm a data engineer in the team that does the forecasting for Maersk. So we do all the forecasting for containers worldwide, that kind of stuff. What we want to do, and I know it sounds like a joke, we want to do things as fast as possible, thinking about container ships that are not so fast, right? So if we look at one of those guys, and I promise it's the only slide about containers, and I will limit myself in the amount of container and Kubernetes jokes I will make in this talk. So uh, just for you to realize that that's, that's what I'm working for. Um, you know, those are the containers I mostly talk about. So we are, we're kind of you know, doing the data science part of like where are these containers or where will they show up in the world worldwide? Um, that's what my team does. And me, me specifically, you know, I'm uh, leading the data engineering team within that. Before you fall asleep or before you see me failing too many times, this is what I want you to take away from this talk. We're trying to improve, and I'm, in this talk I'll show you how we're trying that, to improve the engineering cycles and specifically data engineering dev cycles, which are slightly different from software engineering, and I'll go into detail later by using automatic testing, explicit schema dependencies, and branching by abstraction. And I mean, you know, if I say this, I know in a room of software engineers, this might not be very controversial. But if you go to the data world, this is, is controversial. But I'm trying to spice it up a little bit more later. So let's see how we do this. Why am I here? I think it's because who invited me because I was ranting about DBT at a, at a previous conference. But no, I'm actually here because I get inspired by people like you. Um, there are also some specific people I'm inspired by in my daily life, like Cherry Mayers, um, Lars Alberson, he's actually here, and Eric Bernhardsen. So there's a meme that I, I quite like from him, which is actually about software and infrastructure, but it applies to data as well. And that is, is basically saying, well, what you really want to do with data is you want to test it in production as soon as possible, because you, know, you don't really know how it looks on any other, like n no other scale really matters for us, right? If things don't work at scale, we simply do not care. So that's where we want to get to as fast as possible. And I'm not saying my IQ is that high, not at all, probably, but even though I did a PhD, which is completely unrelated to what I'm doing now. Um, but it's just the idea to try to think, like, how can we get to the actual value part of data engineering as fast as possible? All right. Failing fast with data. And um, those are the main three characters of this story. Uh, it's called the Jam Team. It's Joao. Uh, Andreas and Mika. Mika, that's myself, and I'm a little bit bigger because I have more weight than the other two guys, and I also have a beard, which the other guys don't. So those guys will follow us through uh, some of the story here. And honestly, you know, I, I, I was really ambitious. I was like, I'm going to do some stick figures, Alice in Wonderland. It's going to be so cool. My four-year-old looked at this, and he was like, Meh. and then I stopped. So <laughs> she completely killed that ambition. So this is the level of stick, stick figure drawing we're going to see today. Who of you has been frustrated with data or failed with data in any shape or form? And the rest is lying, or is it, you know, OK. But anyways, you know, we've, we share some frustration, I can see. And there are a million reasons why you fail with data or why your data project fails, quality issues, uh, database never evolved, so, you know, you have a mainframe system, and, and we have this, you know, 40 years old, and, you know, it's a lot of fun to work with this. Um, changes take a long time, you, you introduce bad coupling, oh, and there are millions of reasons why data science, or data science projects fail and why data engineering projects fail or why you can't get value from your data. It's easy to fail on a, on a grand scheme of things, and it's easy to fail even on the small things that are you know, changing a model, changing a data flow, changing something. This is a reality that I live in currently, you know, roughly 500 data and ML jobs, so everything you see here is it's our production setup. Um, that includes, you know, all sorts of kind of products for machine learning, and that's what we handle day to day, right? It's, it's you know, we, I think we at some point calculated somewhere between two and ten millions predictions a day. It's not so much, right? But you think about when you think about containers, right? Um, they move very slow, so it's not like we do a lot of real time. We don't really need that, right? So it's a lot of batch and micro batching. Okay, and so in that scenario, you have me and the Jam team. And we're trying to make changes, and we're trying to be really fast about this because you know business needs to change, and we need to change, and we need to do stuff, we need to deliver value. It's exhausting, and it's complicated. This is just code. This is just data dependency, not code dependency, right? That comes on top of all of this. So there's me, reading something from Eric, saying like, "Hey, 
you want to push the boundary, the, the envelope of speed and quality. So you want to find that red thing. You know, I'm really interested in this red thing. Like, what is this red thing? What is the process? What is the, what is the tool, maybe? Or maybe not the tool. Processes are usually better. Um, what is this red thingy? I really want this red thingy. And Andreas goes like, yes, I also want this red thingy. So that's good. But uh, how do we get that red thingy? Um, so if we just look at what do we actually want to do, and I gave you kind of a spoiler in the beginning, we really only care about data in production. And yes, you have to have all the alerts, data validation, timeliness, blah, blah, blah. We kind of figured that part out, and I'm not going to talk about it, because today is only about how to get data in prod as fast as possible in a safe way. Um, but here's a little story to give you a teaser. So if you look at some of my other talks, I'll talk about this a lot. Uh, I'm talking about this a lot in public. This is a kind of verbatim kind of text message chain from, from our internal uh, team. And the left, so this is me. Something was kind of not working, and it broke because our data check said, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. There's like more than a 1,000 containers. And it's not, again, it's not Kubernetes, right? This is actual containers, like big metal things. And I was like, hey, this, this shouldn't happen. We shouldn't have 1,000 containers on this thing. So you know, we stopped it. We didn't actually publish the data. And one of my colleagues was like, whoa, I've never seen such a shipment that has more than 300. So how can it have above 1,000? That's crazy. Um, and then I said, OK, you know what? We actually have a rather sophisticated way of dealing with data quality. We've done this for years. You know, we have kind of fallback mechanisms to automatically heal the data. OK, we just wait for this to kick in. We're fine, right? We don't have to do anything. And uh, he says, yeah, that's actually a good idea. But he checks it anyways. And he looks like, hey, somebody booked 1,800 containers of frozen macro from China to Africa. This data should have never been in our system at all. Um, and the only good response that I could come up with is, sounds fishy. And, and those are the kind of war stories I'm happy to tell you another time. So it's completely out of scope for today, but I just wanted to give you a teaser of what my daily life looks like. Um, so yeah, we're not going to talk about data validation, you know, our ML products, and functional data engineering. Um, so yeah, come see me next time or look, at, look for my talks elsewhere. So we're going to focus on data and prod. Data and prod, and again, another spoiler, we have everything, of course, in code. We like to you know, adopt a lot of software engineering practices. So we came up with this kind of the critical pass. The critical pass, you, you write code locally, or not locally, but somewhere where it's fast and iterative. You run through CICD, you put it in prod, and then there you make a difference, and then you say, is it good or bad? Right? Because then you compare apples to apples, snapshot to snapshot, things become easy, right? You could say good or bad. Um, no, no environment difference, no extra steps, no mental overhead, like, oh, is this fixed in dev, or is it in staging? I don't know. No, none of this. Nonsense, we just do this. Um, and then failing faster in that respect means, OK, how can we move the things that normally fail only when something runs or when it is in CI? How can we move that to fast cycles? And fast cycles are usually on the left, right? Development locally is very fast. CI can be pretty fast. Running in prod on our scale takes quite a while. And comparing also can take a while, right? So you want to kind of minimize the long cycles and move things that you know are going wrong from the big cycles into the small cycles. It's not a new idea, right? It's just like, how do you do this for data? Because in data, you see you have the jam team, and we have you know, code dependencies that are actually not the same as the data dependencies, right? Data can change over time, um, and the history of data matters. We have to build like, historical data sets for machine learning. You know, we can't just say, oh, this is the current state of the world. Deal with it. No, no, we need to know how things have happened, how markets have shifted, and how customer behavior changed. So in the end, this, you know, the whole data flow is kind of orthogonal, you can think, right? And that means that the way you think about iteration is different. So it's really important we are in prod. It's really important we are looking at scale and compare things. You know, the PR and the unit test is not enough for us to actually say this is good or bad. OK. Typical question, though, is, if, you, if you're telling me, Mika, that you can just push something to prod and be happy, like what could go wrong? I mean, what could go wrong? Ah, you just test in production. It's fine. You know, it's no problem. No, nobody ever crashed production in data. Nobody's laughing. That's really hard to. Uh... <laughs> Anyways, OK. Um, so lots of things can obviously go wrong. And I want to talk about a couple of those today. Um, will my job run? Right? Of course, your, 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 your job should run if it passes CI or passes local test. Why doesn't it run? 
you know, why do you have to deploy to dev to figure out that it runs in an environment? You should know that kind of before, yeah. roughly, right? And I know, you know, a lot of nodding heads, a lot of software engineers here, they know that this is good, but it's not really a popular opinion necessarily in data. Yeah. Um, then you can also think about things like, okay, what happens if the, if the schema changes? If I make a schema change, what is affected? As you saw the big graph, I don't have this graph in my head, right? I need the system to tell me, hey, you're breaking this thing 10 steps down because it's orthogonal to the, co to the, code, uh, to the code dependency, right? So that the code for one job has no dependence on the code for another job, but they do depend and they transiently depend on one another. So that needs to be there. And you should be able to figure this out, right? Um, you have other questions. Does my transformation work? And then the last question, of course, is my data good at scale? Let's see if we can answer this in a good way. All right. I'm also going a bit too fast. So, and that's the kind of my problem. I always talk very fast. I fail very fast. I hope something good comes out of this, but we'll see. OK, first question, will my job run? And, and this is a story that actually happened last year where, out of spite, I built something that worked so well that now we use it everywhere. And it's actually, I did it on a Sunday on parental leave and that is like the POC, and it actually worked so well. I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite happy about this. Um, so we, you know, or anybody in data, you know, will have some kind of configuration, either in code or configuration files, doesn't matter, but that tells you about, okay, I have a job that has some inputs, has some code that it runs, and some output. It could be SQL, could be PySpark, could be Python, could be anything, it doesn't really matter. So what we did, and we used PySpark in this particular instance, is that we then say, hey, if we know this and we know what schema we expect on the input and output, it should be super easy to automatically test this. And I don't mean automatic testing in terms of like you write a test and then you know, it gets automatically tested in CI. I mean like you generate a test for, for a job based on the configuration you already have and make sure it runs. So you don't have to do anything as a developer in order to see that it actually runs with the, with the input uh, schema and output schema. And it turns out you can do this extremely simple. You don't actually need data to test this. You just need the schema. Um, and you maybe need 200 lines of code to do this. Um, and uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at this, you see like this is, this is fine. But it's really, it's really simple, right? You take, a, you take an input. You create gen randomly generated data. You, do, you, you run your Spark code on that. Spark says, OK, I can actually do this transformation. I can also spit out some data. That data might be empty because you don't have like, random data, so you can't join. But it will still tell you, OK, I can do this transformation, or I can't do that transformation. Good. And I also, you know, it also tells you, oh, this schema you're, you're expecting as output? Yes, I produced that schema. OK, so you know that. What happens if schema changes? Well, it's the same picture. It's just, you know, there's, there's an input version 2 schema there. It's the same thing. It will fail, right? And it also means that, of course, if that is based on the data set, if now something transiently depends on that down, you know, somewhere else, you test it automatically, you will see, okay, this actually fails. So the Jam Trio, or the cavemen, the caveman coders that we are, uh, we don't have to think about the graph. We don't have to think about dependencies. The test will tell us, hey, you're breaking this thing down there. You need to kind of take care of this, right? And that's a really good thing. Um, so this is how it looks in practice because I wanted to do something a bit more tangible than just telling you about concepts and drawing boxes. Imagine you have a configuration. Now we use YAML because we like containers, so we use YAML. Uh, then we, this thing, you know, basically you see there is an input thing, and it says, hey, I have input data set, and then we have a JSON file that we call schema registry, but it's, I mean, we like dumb and su stupid things, right? It's just, a, it's just a JSON that points to a um, schema class. This is it, a Python class. And by now, you know, it's, it's adopted so much that this also works for pandas and R and, and stuff. So it's kind of a unified way of looking at schemas. Um, so it looks for this. It said, hey, I can use this to auto-generate your test data. Again, I don't have to do anything as a developer. This is happening in a, per it's a single unit test or a single pytest test that does all of this. It will then look at the code. Now, this is some bad code, right? that I wrote specifically for you to tell me how bad my code is. It's actually not my code, but it doesn't matter. Um, so it runs some code, and then it does some transformation on a single column, whatever that transformation will do. Um, and then it will do an assert on the output. So you see you can, with very simple tooling, checking configuration, running the code that is supposed to run, input, output, bam, you have it. 
you know that it's breaking. And because the, the schema registry is there, you will also see if the transient things that depend on certain columns down the line will actually break. So that's cool. So in essence, what we've done is, we've, the only thing we've done is we've specified explicitly the dependency of the, you know, of the jobs and the schemas. That's all we really did. And then we added an automatic test. Simple. Again, it was a very small project. What about more in-depth testing? And actually, I'm telling the story wrong because we started to use things like this, and then we came to the auto tester later. That's a different talk, I guess. Um, but if you remember the code I just showed you on the left, basic, basic job. Then on the right, you write a basic, basic PyTest, but you're using the schema so you can make sure that your, 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 your tests are not rotting away. So if you wanted to test this, you would never wanted to test this job. But there are problems when you kind of have like seven data sets, you try to merge them and kind of repair some kind of historical view of something, you really want to test that this goes the way you think it goes, right? And in those cases, you can use this, and you can make sure that you're using, you can, you can leverage this, um, um, the, the kind of the same technology to generate data frames, and very specifically, so this input data set, it could have like a million columns, but you only want to act on one, so you can just specify that, meaning you get like a very small, you get a very like, minimal way of setting up tests. You get, uh, you get data, data as code rather than files, which is also important because if you're using sample files today, I mean, that's going to slow you down in the long run immensely. right? Don't use sample files for these kind of things. It's going to kill you um, if you really want to be fast. At least that's the inner pattern that we, we saw, and I think there are some people who would agree with that. Um, you can do TDD like this, actually. Um, again, I wouldn't test all data jobs necessarily like with very specific uh, tests because it's not really necessary. You don't want to test the framework. But there might be instances where this is a good idea. And if you adopt this, it means that if you have a couple of use cases or a couple of cases for your TDD, you say, OK, I have these things. They, they, they work like this in transformation. I see an edge case in production now after three months because suddenly something happens. You, just add a new, you can just add a new scenario to your tests. Right? You don't have to do updates of sample files and all this crap. Sorry, my, excuse my language. Um, you can just keep on coding, right? So it's, a, it's way more maintainable. But it does come as a cost, of course. So it's not for free, whereas the auto testing is for free. All right. So here I actually just highlighted some of the pitfalls, as I said. You know, data as code is better than files for your testing. You also want to avoid having like extremely small unit tests. And that's a big pitfall for, for TDD, right? You don't really want to have, like, let's say you have, a, you have a transformation that's rather complex. You don't want to factor that into 10 functions and test those. That's going to be really, really hard because you know, data basically runs in from the top input to output. So if you're testing across that, you'll have a, you have a really hard time just maintaining those tests, maintaining those interfaces. It's hard. So probably you don't want to do that. And you want to use like full tests or multiple tests. I told you something about data validation before. I gave you this little non-Kubernetes joke. Um, there is way more that you need to do, of course, to get that running. Um, again, it's not covered today. The success of this was so great, of this out of spite driven POC, that it was now adopted to all our products. And I mean like our products, the forecasting products, so also like data science pipelines, because they saw, well, if you're telling me that you can guarantee with an automatic test that this thing will actually run, of course I want this. Right? If you can help me to not have tests that are rotting, of course I want this. It's clear value. There's no, no discussion, in my opinion, around this. And I want to quote one of my, of my Jam Trio uh, colleagues, Andreas, who, who calls this thing the productivity handcuffs, which I think is exactly the right term. Right? You're, kind of, you're in a way forced to have these schemas registered, but then you're getting super productive because now you can, how oh, I can actually make this change in, like, in no time. Like, it's automatically tested. It will run. Hey, I can just push it out. Things become simpler. All right. So I'm not telling you the full truth, of course, because if you're actually doing pivoting and stacking of data sets, you need to do a bit more work. If you want to do this, talk to me. We also solve that. Um, so if you, if you remember what I was just talking about, we kind of can do these things. We can tell, you, we can tell if a job will run. We can tell if it uh, produces the, the correct schema. We can uh, make unit tests in a way that, they're not, that they don't rot, because they don't depend on like, old sample files. Right? Um, what this doesn't tell you, of course, is if the data is good at scale. Right? And I don't mean now data checks and validation, again, out of scope. 
but I just mean like you haven't really checked that, and that is really what you need to check, right? So coming back to this, um, if you look at the right, you want to learn in production, so we haven't really talked about this, this part yet. That's the next part. Um, and that becomes more complicated because, you know, Joao, the developer on the left here, he is typing away very happily on his thing, but there are more people you need to integrate with, right? Continuous integration. So when we come in at the CI step, right, our changes ought to come in. And again, it's complicated because we, we have code changes. So if you, let's say you want to do a merge with somebody, but this person is working on something that is a different pipeline, you normally don't get merge conflict or any, you don't really know that you work on the same thing. But you could depend on each other based on data dependencies, right? So, yeah, just, just written out, right? So data dependencies is not the same as code dependencies. You can have also problems with state and data. We typically avoid that by, by using certain ways of, of architecture now or stuff. Um, and the kind of universal truth that explicit is better than implicit. So, you know, for those of you who, who don't know yet, of course, I'm going into like, you know, feature toggling or, you know, basically trunk based development. Um, so if we think of a, a data pipeline that looks like this, like a very tiny part of our setup, um, and now Joao, you know, one of my good friends from the Jam tour, he comes in, he says that, wow, I just want to, you know, split these data sets up because I really want to use this for some really cool ML. I have this really good idea. I'm doing this now. In a very far away planet, this guy, which is me, is like, hey, I just need to make this little fix here and I'm going to update the schema because well, whatever, right? I'm removing this column because it's not used. I'm cleaning up. I'm doing God's work. The problem is, you know, if I'm just looking at the, up, the upper, upmost the red one, right? I change this, I update the, the, up, the lower one just to make sure it works, but then this happens. So neither Joao or me are happy, or one is happy because he got the changes in first, and the other one is not happy because things have changed before you did this. And none of us had the opportunity to even look at what actually happens downstream. So if we go back, right, all the way back, the lowest one is, of course, like depending on all these changes. We haven't really looked at this, right? So, okay, we're in this angry state. We don't want to be in the angry state. We like to be happy people. We like to be a happy jam trio. Um, and, and being happy and doing CI means collaborating in a nice way, right? And so if you can actually produce jobs very fast and you can actually make sure they run, you can just do this. You, you can make all your changes just in prod right next to it. There's no need to do anything else because why would you? In the end, you want to do the difference of the outcome anyways. And then you're happy. Of course, it's an ideal world, and it's not always like this, you know, but, but in the end, what this should tell you is like, you know, if you're working in, in the isolated feature branch, especially in data, you run into tons of problems. On top of all the problems you get from like long-running feature branches and software, you get all of that plus the problems from the data problems. So it's not a good place to be in. So being explicit about this is, is a good thing. Um, the way you can solve this, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking way too fast, so you know, if it's really, really fast failing here, it's, it's good. Um, is that you can use feature toggles. Again, well known in software, uh, uh, software development, not so well known in the data world. Or you can just build in prod, because well, if I can safely go to prod without making any breakages, I mean, why not just build in prod? Like, what's holding you back from doing that? Um, and then you can compare there. Then it becomes easy. You have two data sets, done. They have the same lineage, they depend on the same data, easy to compare, apples to apples. Now, sorry about the very different color coding here, but that this is an old slide where we talked about how do we actually then do this? Like, how do we, uh, how do, we do this in our setup if we wanted to say, for example, um, run a model? So here you have like a thing where you have events data, you have some data pipeline that massages the data into a time series, and then you have an inference step that takes a model input and runs, makes a prediction. Okay, but now somebody came, maybe, maybe your PO comes and like, hey, but we really want to kind of, you know, we, we saw this thing, we have these, this data in there, can we not do some other massaging? Right? Can we not do something? Can you do some data engineering magic to make this go away? And then it's like, ooh, oh, I have to build like all this stuff. But no, actually, you know, you can do it easy. So we have this kind of shadow experiment setup where we say, well, just, let's just make one feature branch, or it's not a feature branch, it's a, it's a feature toggle, which says, okay, I just use those jobs that are already there, they're already configured, and I override them to say, well, I just want to run all the stuff here, like the, uh, the massage and the inference, and then I'm just going to get a prediction, 
that is you're using the same models as in production, but just with a different data, and make a diff here. And literally, adding this, this YAML is all it takes. Right? So this is the cost of making an experiment in production. Right? And now think about that, and think about that you're a software engineer. It's like, hey, wait a minute. If I can do this, can I not write a script and make 100 of those? Yeah, you can. It's not a problem. Like, we're using some container thing, so it probably works. So you can do this very, very fast at a very low cost. All the stuff is running on spot nodes. You, know, you only have one environment, so you don't have like, all this bloat. You don't have to think about migrating through environments. You can do this, right? It's not rocket science um, at all. Of course, it requires you know how to orchestrate and manage jobs and, and so on and so forth. But I hope that I could give you like, some really tangible steps of like, how you can think about what is the goal for data science, what is the goal for data engineering, and that is you know, providing value in production. Nothing else counts. And if you think that way, maybe this helps you to think about how you become faster and uh, better at what you're, what you're building. All right, time for a summary. And if you want to stay longer, I have like 50 slides on data quality, but maybe that's not so good for the end of the, um, the session. Again, I hope I could show you that we are able to improve data engineering cycle times by using these technologies or these techniques or processes that I uh, talked to you about. In our case, just to give an example, we used to, when I, when I joined the team, we used to depend on some internal um, data warehouse. Changes would take six months upwards. And this is just a single change in a single data set that we would receive. Today, of course, we do everything from raw data up to you know, predictions. Um, we can change central data sets. Basically, it's bottlenecked by the CI CD pipeline runtime, right? Because we do so many tests that it's, it's a little bit of a problem right now. I mean, we're talking 20 minutes, right? Which is too fast. Uh, it's, not, it's not fast enough for us. But that's kind of the bottleneck. So think about like one hour to make a change, adding a column, doing something different, fixing a bug. That's in production, right? That is not in dev or anything. All right. The tools or the, the things that I showed you were automatic testing. And you could say it's automatic, automatic testing, right? Because you're kind of generating these tests on the fly. Um, explicit schema dependencies. Sounds simple. It's simple. You should definitely do it if you don't do it. Branching by abstraction, again, also known. And I think it's very, it's very good to use it in data. Or you just build in production, right? Your choice. I think depending on use case, one makes more sense than the other. but. You know, it's of course up to you. And once you do this, you're hopefully going to be happy ever after, which is not true because then it's just the next red thingy you're, you're chasing, right? The red, what is the next thing? And for us, the next thing is now how do we make this comparison prod better? How can we automate that better? How can we put that into our process so it becomes faster? Um, so again, if you want to talk data quality, I have this all of these slides, but. Let's go back. Let's live heavily, happily ever after on this day. And I'm happy to take questions, because we have, I think, a couple of minutes left. And I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you. <laughs> but also feel free to go. Yes, Hugo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, but it's also a smoke test of the code. Oh, sorry, the question was if the, if the, the auto auto tester is, is just uh, comparing schemas. And uh, in a way, yes, yes, because that's what it asserts on. But it runs the actual code. So it is a smoke test of the code, right? So it's like, let's say you would select a column that is not actually there, which you could easily do if you type in some SQL. Like, oh, shit, OK, it doesn't actually work. It can't happen, because the test will tell you locally, like, hey, the job that you created actually doesn't pass the local test. Go back and fix, right? So you're in this, in this faster loop. Probably didn't explain that very well, but you're staying in this faster loop of like running the test, making the job, running the test. So, so that's kind of the idea. Cool. Feel free to take some coffee or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't want to hold you here. <laughs> Thank you very much.